Um, welcome everyone. My name is Laurie Slap. I will be moderating the warrant briefing this evening um, in advance of the special town meeting coming up on September 21st. Um, first off, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring the event tonight and also to thank everyone for joining in, especially um, all our town department heads, um, Patrice and John, um, and all others who have put a lot of time into preparing for the town meeting. Um, I think to begin, uh, Mike Widmer can say just a few words about the logistics of the meeting. So if you can jump in, Mike, that would be terrific. Thank you, Laurie. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I just wanted to explain to town meeting members that uh, it's my hope that we'll be able to cover articles one through eight on the first night, Monday the 21st, especially because we begin at six o'clock. Uh, I'm not going to have us run late, however, I hope we could end by 10. We would then, under any circumstances, we'll begin the second night, Wednesday, the 23rd with Article 9, the McLean issue. And then that leaves Article 10, civil service. Uh, depending how long McLean takes, uh, we may have an opportunity to uh, bring up civil service on the 23rd and complete action on the, all the articles in two nights. If that seems um, unfair uh, that we start too late on civil service and obviously a complex issue, then we'll simply uh, adjourn early on the 23rd and reconvene on the 30th, starting off and uh, with the final article of civil service. So it'll be either two or three nights. One final comment, I would ask that uh, during debate that people uh, keep their comments to three minutes or less uh, and uh, any questions to no more than two questions. So that we can move it along. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Mike. That's great. All right, I will move along. Oops, excuse me. Next, um, just to go over a little bit about the format um, for this evening. As as you all know, the purpose tonight is really to gather all the information that you'll need for the debate coming up at town meeting. Um, we did have two sessions earlier this week on Tuesday regarding the uh, rezoning. Uh, for zone three in the McLean development and last night about civil service. Um, but this one is even more restricted to just uh, factual questions and answers. Um, as you'll see here, we're sticking with the standard practice and similar to uh, try to keep things moving, we ask that you only ask two questions um, and keep them to two minutes. Uh, the goal is to wrap up no later than nine o'clock this evening. And we'll try to get, make sure everyone has a chance to ask the questions they have so if you have multiple questions, we'll go to those who have not asked one first. Um, again, please save your speeches until town meeting on the 21st, and this should all go very smoothly. Um, I'm just going to run through the motions and the articles in their order. Um, so first off, we, as usual, the um, town meeting will begin with the reports. Um, I understand that this time there will be an update from Roy Epstein, the select board chair, about the finances. And then we'll have a video regarding the completion of the DPW project. Um, next up will be in Article 2 is regarding the public way at Carlton Circle. As many of you know, Carlton Circle runs between Common Street and Washington Street, close to the Chenery. And for this one, I will ask Glenn Clancy to give a little bit of an overview um, of this article, and then we'll open it up for questions. Hi. Good evening, Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. Uh, Carlton Circle is a private way. Uh, the uh, nine abutters who live on Carlton Circle desire to be, um, have their road accepted as a public way. And by statute, in order for that to happen in Belmont, town meeting has to accept the roadway. This is, um, there are several private ways in Belmont. I'm gonna guess there's 40 to 50 different private ways. Um, Several of them over the years have tried unsuccessfully to have their roads accepted as public ways. Um, the primary hurdle for them has been trying to get the, uh, all of the abutters to agree uh, to have the road accepted as a public way. Carlton Circle was able to get their nine abutters to agree. Um, I think primarily because they were very fortunate to have their road already repaved courtesy of National Grid. 
Um, many of you will recall the construction project on Common Street that lasted for a couple of years, and I may be being generous when I say that. Um, but one of the benefits that came out of the construction work on Common Street was because Natural Grid was using Carlton Circle as a staging area, they so impacted that private way that they agreed to repave the road. Um, we, the town, stepped in at that point and worked with National Grid to have them repave that road to meet the town standards, uh, which is required in the Board of Survey Rules and Regulations. And what that really did at that point was clear the way for the abutters to petition the town to have the road accepted as a public way. The abutters do not have to bear the expense of that repaving because National Grid did that. Um, at the end of all of the conversation, it really came down to a small amount of money to cover the cost of sidewalk maintenance. Um, all of the abutters split that cost equally, made that payment to the town, and it, it is sitting in an account now pending a town meeting approval for the acceptance of the road. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for um, Article 2? If you do, please just raise your hand in the Zoom world, um, and we will get those answered for you. Don't think I'm seeing any. Um, so I will move on. Oh, I'm sorry, Martha Moore. There, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my question is just, um, I'm not quite sure. Once it becomes a town street, I'd just like to know, I mean, assuming it does, um, a little bit about um, what it does is it commits the town to do repaving, anything else? I mean, what, what does it mean again to be a sure. town? So uh, Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. So Martha, what it means is really, it's all the maintenance that you would find uh, for a public right of way. So it is sidewalk, it is roadway, it is public shade tree. Uh, it's really all of the elements that fall within the right of way. Um, one of the reasons uh, this process has been onerous for many of the private ways and the owners are on the private ways is that the cost to bring those elements up to today's standards can be sizable. If National Grid didn't repave Carlton Circle, the abutters would have been looking at approximately $100,000 when you look at paving costs, engineering design costs, you know, all of the kind of ancillary costs that would go into the reconstruction of that road. That would have been $100,000 divided by nine property owners. Uh, there is a process through state statute that allows that payment to be spread out over a period of 10, 15, or 20 years for betterment process. Um, which essentially becomes an annual payment on the tax bill of the abutters until that cost is paid off. Um, because National Grid brought that road up to standards right now, uh, the, cost, the cost that was remaining to bring the road up to standard, and it was sidewalk repair work is what it was, was minimal. Um, one of the other you know, sort of you know, ways that this process is designed is that all of, all of the amenities are brought up to standard um, to, with, with the abutters covering that cost so that even though the town is accepting the road as a public way, they're not accepting the immediate cost of bringing that road up to standard. So on a road like Carlton Circle, you're looking at probably a 20 to 25 year period of time before that road would have to be repaved again. Um, and that's the way that the process is set up. Any pro private way that came uh, to town meeting today, the abutters would have to pay to have that roadway reconstructed and brought up to standard. And then sometime in the future, as I said, 20, 25 year time frame, the town would then be on the hook or be responsible for maintaining that road, just like they would any other private way. But I think it's important to stress that the way the program is set up, uh, those costs are initially borne by the abutters upfront so that that immediate burden doesn't fall on the town. Okay, I get that. It's just, so what we're doing is committing to, um, just let me ask you, <laughs> we, what we're doing is committing to, um, to the future maintenance. So it still will cost the town money someplace down the, time down the road. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely true. Um, as I said, it'll fold into the other public ways in the town and uh, any maintenance that's required um, you know, will be programmed and addressed accordingly, just like any other private, um, pardon me, just like any other public way. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, I see a Jean Rooney. You have your hand up. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, Glenn, question. Um, are public ways versus private ways, is there a multiplier um, effect or impact on the assessment value of a home that's on a private way versus a public way? Okay, I guess the question is, will this affect the assessment of those homes now that they are on a public way? Oh, um, God. Are we introducing ourselves? I feel like I don't want to be <laughs> beating the dead horse here, but Glenn <laughs> Clancy, Director of Community Development. <laughs> Uh, Gene, that's a great question. It really is a question that should be aimed at the assessors. Um, my understanding is that the assessors do have, um, you know, they do factor in some variable for uh, neighborhood condition and, and streetscape, I, I believe. Um, but I'm not certain about that. That's really the assessor's office would have to answer that question. Yeah, I believe there is a street a streetscape um, multiplier. Um, but so I suspect if there's a cost to, to the town at some point, I would suspect that there may be an impact on um, a, assessment of those homes. So that may uh, be a mitigating you know, issue in terms of maintenance costs. So I just thought I'd mention that. Thank yep. you. Well, thank you. And, and this is also helpful as uh, we get ready for town meeting, we'll make sure we get answers to questions just like that. Um, Deb Lockett, your hands up. Yes, thanks. Uh, great explanation, Glenn. Thank you. A uh, question about has the town always plowed? Hey, dot, dot, dot. The town yeah. has always plowed private ways, if that's Private the ways. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just, I, you know what, just a quick follow up because, Deb, maybe your thinking is going in this direction. You know, we do have. A, a small number of what are really considered private driveways and not private roadways. I'm thinking specifically about the Northland Development and McLean Hospital. Even those, even though those, you know, they look for all intent and purposes like a roadway, for our purposes in the town, they're considered private driveways. The town does not plow them. Um, further, the town does not provide trash services or anything like that. That is a true private development. But the statutory private ways that we talk about in Belmont, like a Calton Circle, um, those have always been maintained, you know, snow plowing by the town. So all of the trash and various other public services are still part of the private way. It's just who bears the cost to bring it up to a certain standard in order to become a public and then public then takes over the maintenance of the road. That's correct. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I think that's the last of the questions for Article 2. Um, I don't see any more. We can always come back if needed. Um, but for now, let's move ahead to Article 3. Again, Glenn will help us with that one. Um, and this one is about the authorization for temporary easements um, for the Wellington Safe Routes to School project. Um, as you'll see here on the map, this just shows the roads <coughs> important around the uh, elementary school, around Wellington, I should say. Um, and Glenn, if you could help us with this one as well, um, just to give a brief overview, and we'll, then we'll open it up for questions. Sure. So, this project, Safe Routes to School project for the Wellington Elementary School, the design, the construction, all being funded by MassDOT under, under their Safe Routes to School program. Um, a few years ago, uh, several Belmont residents, um, many of them PTA members at the Wellington, got together and submitted an application to MassDOT to be considered for upgrades um, around the school. Upgrades aimed primarily at pedestrian safety. Um, obviously, school walking routes are a big factor in the Safe Routes to School program. Uh, the application was chosen by MassDOT for further evaluation. Ultimately, MassDOT decided that they would fund an improvement project for the town. Um, all great work. You know, the, the, the PTA organization and the parents who stepped up, just all great work. So here we are now. So we're on the cusp of this project uh, being ready for construction. Uh, the one thing, and this is very similar to the Chapella Road Belmont Street project that we had a few years ago. The one thing that the state will not fund when they fund these projects is what they call securing the right of way. And what securing the right of way really means is the, the, the state and behind the state federal highway because the federal dollars that come down that trickle into the state originate at the federal level and federal highway has the oversight on that funding. 
what they want to know is, does the municipality, does MassDOT and their contractors have the right to step on private property if they have to make repairs to a front lawn that abuts a new sidewalk, if they have to patch in a couple of feet of driveway to meet that new sidewalk, they want to make sure that every abutting property owner has granted permission for the contractors to be able to step on their property to do this, really this touch up kind of um, punch list related work. Um, it sounds very simple and it, it, and it doesn't sound like too heavy a lift. Um, it's a bear. <laughs> it's a bear. Uh, we had 300 abutters on Chapella Road, Belmont Street. Um, that, that effort was reduced to Senator Brownsburger literally standing on front porches on a Saturday morning, knocking on doors, trying to get people to sign forms. On this project, we've got, we've got nine temporary easements and one permanent easement. Um, the temporary easements are the, are the easements that I described. Uh, the ability for a contractor to make a repair to the edge of a, of a, a lawn, uh, to patch in a driveway or a front walk, that type of thing. The permanent easement is because there is a property that has uh, Belmont Municipal Light wiring crossing over above the corner of their property. Um, it's a very common occurrence with overhead wiring, um, but because of this requirement with Federal Highway through Mass DOT, we have to get formal approval for those wires to remain there. Um, and so the, the, the purpose of the Warren article is to make sure that we have the money necessary because as I said, MassDOT uh, Federal Highway, they do not fund securing the right of way. So what does the $100,000 do for us? Well, there's a couple of things that we're required to do because we are talking about easements, even though they are temporary. So there is nothing permanent. There is, there is no desire for anyone to want to use private property to stockpile materials, to park vehicles, nothing like that. If you look on the plans that are associated with the project, you'll find that generally speaking, you're talking you know, a three to five foot swath of land behind the sidewalk is the amount of property that we're talking about for most of the properties along the uh, project scope. We need all of the property owners to grant that consent. Um, because it's temporary easement, and in one case permanent easement, there is registry of deeds effort that needs to be done by town council because these ultimately become legal documents even though they're only for a temporary period. Temporary, by the way, being three years. Um, so we need to make sure we have uh, the funding put aside to pay for council to do the registry of deeds work. The process requires the town to have a certified appraiser on board. Um, different from the Chapella Road project in my experience on that project, they now require you to have a review appraiser. So somebody doing a peer review on the original appraisal. Um, so there's a, there's a fee that's associated with that. And then ultimately, if a property owner isn't interested or willing to sign um, what's called a certificate of donation, which is essentially granting permission for the access to their property. If they're not willing to do that, they have a right under the federal guidelines to ask for an appraisal. Once the appraisal is complete, the appraiser is going to put a dollar value on the cost of impacting that strip of land for a period of three years. Um, just to give you, a, you know, um, to give you an idea, on the, on the Tupelo Road project, most of the residential properties, that appraised value came out at about $125. So we're not talking about a lot of money. What I don't know is if there's been any kind of an escalation in those appraisals from, you know, back in 2010, 2012, when we were doing it before versus the eight to 10 years that have passed now. Um, so there's a fee to pay the appraisers. There's a fee to pay the property owners. If it gets to that point, there's a fee to cover the legal costs to make sure all the registry work can be done. Um, boy, I'll tell you, as I sit here, I, I, I almost, I knock wood here, I don't want to jinx myself, but I, I, I believe in my heart that that $100,000 is a high number, okay? Um, I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but I just did. Here, here's the motivation. MassDOT is at the point in this project where come the spring, they want to advertise this thing, but they will not give the go ahead to advertise until that right of way is secure, which means that 
If we don't have the resources in place to allow us to lock down this right of way over the next few months, we're gonna end up holding up the project and we're gonna delay MassDOT from being able to bid this thing. So it really is very much a better safe than sorry approach that we're taking. Um, I think it mentions it in the article, what we're proposing is to, is to pay the costs either out of chapter 90 or out of the existing payment management funds that we already have, um, you know, already, already have sitting in an account that we could utilize. Um, so I, I, that's kind of a long-winded explanation as to what's happening here. I will just let me add one other thing. When, when Public Works does a sidewalk project in the town, they probably send a notice to the people who live on the street and say, hey, great news, we're gonna give you guys new sidewalks. Everybody gets excited, Public Works goes in, their contractors strip out the old sidewalk, they build a new sidewalk, they fix the grass areas, they fix the driveways, everybody goes home happy, there's, there's, everything is just great. This is exactly what we're talking about on this project, except because it's federal and state dollars attached to it, Federal Highway adds this level of requirement that we never have to deal with on the local level. But, but it's a necessary evil, and it's certainly one that we expected going into this. But at the end of the day, even if we do push up to $100,000, leveraging $100,000 for a project that's ultimately gonna be uh, somewhere around $1.5, $1.6 million, I think it's a fair trade-off. Thank you, that was really helpful. Um, I see Jack Weiss has his hand up. Uh, this is a small detail question. It's not related to the overall um, uh, thrust of what you just said, Glenn. I'm uh, curious about the discrepancy between the drawing that's shown on the screen now and the detailed drawings that were sent to town meeting members. The one that's on the screen has Orchard Street on it, a portion of Godin, uh, Common Street, and what... Uh, at least from what I saw in the drawings, all of the work looked like it was on School Street, a portion of Waverly, and a portion of Cottage, which aren't shown in this red outline. So I'm, I'm curious what this red outline signifies. Um, I take responsibility for this one. When I, I had the very detail, I would refer you back to what is in actually was sent to all town meeting members, which was very hard to put on the screen. So someone said, here's an easy one to plug in. So I put this in. It's not meant to be as taken as specifically as the all the detailed material sent to the town meeting members. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Sorry about that. And any unnecessary confusion that I caused. Apologies for that. Uh, let's Deb Lockett. I see your hand is up. This is Deb, Precinct 7. Thank you so much, Glenn, once again, for a great explanation. Um, a quick question about the trees. What happens with the trees on those sidewalks? So there, I'm, I'm never gonna get my bearings here. So the, the, the sidewalk on School Street that is opposite the Wellington School, um, there are trees along there that are scheduled to be removed. These are trees that are within the public right of way um, some of you may be aware that there's actually a parcel of town-owned land that starts up on School Street. It's, it's the playground area that eventually, you know, terminates down below at the Underwood Pool. Um, any, of the, any of the trees that are on private property are untouched. Um, and that goes for other private property as well, not just the town-owned, you know, quote-unquote private property. Um, the reason that the, some of the shade trees on School Street have to be removed on, on the opposite side is because on the school side, the sidewalk is being widened so that it can accommodate a bicycle and a pedestrian. And so and because, you're, because you're dealing with a limited width of right of way, when you increase the width of sidewalk on that side of the road, something has to give. And it is essentially the shoulder that exists on the opposite side of the road. So the shoulder goes away on the opposite side, that takes the trees with it, uh, but what you gain um, what you gain in width is actually a wider walk along the church property up to the Wellington School property to accommodate bicycle and pedestrian. Should also add that we are um, significantly tightening up the curb cuts along St. Joseph's Church. Uh, I had a meeting with the pastor and, and the gentleman who represents the uh, property interest for the, for the archdiocese. Um, they are in support of what we're doing. Um, we're not eliminating curb cuts necessarily, but we are making them narrower um, and much more obvious visually um, so that it'll be much safer for pedestrians and bicycles um, coming in from Common Street, getting to the Wellington School 
it won't feel like it's so much an, a, an open parking lot anymore like it does today. So any idea how many trees we lose? I mean, typically when we lose a tree, we replace it. So uh, um, I know it's not a huge area, but I mean, they offer in this day and age of climate change and heat, just such relief and shade. And I totally understand that you have to make it wider for ADA compliance, et cetera. Um, that's my question. Deb, I want to say it was two trees, but I'm going to confirm oh. that and I'll have a firm answer for town meeting. Thanks, um, Glenn. I want to say it was two, um, but I'll confirm that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I don't see any other hands up at the moment. Um, so let's move along now. Um, to Article 4. Um, this is the uh, Community Preservation Commission commit projects. Um, as you'll see, some of the three at the top were supposed to be considered in the spring before the COVID pandemic, pandemic hit. Um, and then we have two new ones added on. Um, so my thought here is just to go through each one. Um, as you'll see, I hope my little uh, visuals are actually accurate this time going forward, um, but just to put something up and again, this is the chance to ask questions. Um, first off is the uh, town field playground and court restoration. Um, this request is for $680,624. Um, the sponsor is the Friends of the um, Excuse me. Uh, the Friends of Townfield Playground, and this is to actually do the construction of this project that we've talked about for several years. Um, in 2018, there was preliminary funding, and then there was actually the design bid and documentation phase in 2019. Um, so again, I know Courtney Eldridge is here. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say at this point, um, or if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and we will do our best to answer them. I'm not seeing any hands raised at this stage. Courtney, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to, to add. I think there's been a lot of information about this project over the years. Yeah, definitely. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's Courtney Eldridge, Friends of Townfield Playground. I'm also on the Recreation Commission. Um, the only note that I wanted to just let you guys know is that we did reach our fundraising goal. Um, I thought that might be of interest to the Warrant Committee. We had uh, promised $25,000 to raise, and we have hit that target. So. The number that we're requesting here is 680 as planned. I've been working with Jay, who is on the line. Um, if there's any very technical questions, I'm gonna punt them to him. Um, but he and I are sort of in lockstep with this project. The design firm has um, a little bit of green left, so they are you know, working on those final pieces and uh, we'll be able to go out to bid in the uh, late winter, early spring, if um, you know, we get a positive vote. Great, thank you very much. Um, Jack Weiss, I see your hand is up. Jack Weiss, Precinct 1. Uh, Courtney, just a quick question. I think I asked this uh, uh, at a, a different session, but the pickleball courts, um, are, are they designed in a way that has an adaptive reuse to the extent that uh, today's fad of pickleball fizzles out in five years and is no longer the fad that it is right now? Is there a way to use that space functionally for something else? So at the moment, um, if you're familiar with the, this area, we, it's at the intersection of Beach and Waverly Streets. And right now there's a tennis wall that's there. Um, we heard loud and clear from our community that that tennis wall is fabulous. So we're keeping the tennis wall, which will be in between the two courts, which allows for, you know, pickleball does fizzle out and that's not something of interest in the future. We'll still have that tennis wall that people will be able to use um, anecdotally outside of actual court usage. This is a place that's very highly used for children learning to ride their bikes or roller skating, rollerblading, all that kind of stuff on that hard top. So it, it's, I expect that it's going to have a lot of use even if pickleball is not quite as popular in the future as it is now. Although trends show that pickleball is a fabulous sport. I know very little about it, but uh, maybe, maybe it's the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate Bowen is next. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I was just going to ask if the 
group had looked at the, the total loss of trees um, as, a, as a carbon emissions factor, um, well, really a sequestration factor, um, because I do recall there were some very large trees um, towards the corner of the park. And so I was, uh, if there's funding left in the project and they're still in that phase of the planning, it would be great to see uh, additional shade um, in this park. It is, it is one of the parks that gets a lot, of, uh, a lot of heat. And I know there were quite a few trees lost already in that space. Maybe you could expand on that. As yeah, well. definitely. So one of the biggest complaints when we started um, just researching this project with our community members was that uh, it's a hot park that does not get used in the summer. There's not a lot of shade there. Um, I realize that I can't read architectural drawings very well. So Jay, please keep me in check here if I'm misrepresenting this, but the darker sort of, it's hard to see here, but the, the fluffy trees are the trees that currently exist um, and the, circle the sort of more symmetrical circles here are new planted trees to this space so you can see I mean we can sort of count those out to see exactly what that is I do know that the DPW removed I believe it was three trees at sort of the peak of Waverly and Beach earlier this summer that was part of their traditional um, or their sort of typical this tree is going to die we should remove it before it injures property removal um, but you can see from the lighter green more circular circles here those are the trees that will be planted as part of this project and those are in the budget now great thank you sure. um next i see aaron pick a link is stand up hi this is aaron pickling town meeting member of precinct six i have a frivolous basketball player question when you're rehabbing the basketball court, are you willing to remove the camouflaged ankle breaking curb that surrounds the basketball court? Uh, yes, uh, apparently. So I've only been in Belmont for six years and I think that the basketball courts outdate my age. Um, but as far as I understand, the basketball courts used to be flooded and frozen for an ice skating rink, which is why that hard curb exists. Um, that hard curb will go away as far as I understand. Again, Jay, if I'm misrepresenting some, something here, please definitely set me straight. But as far as I understand, that's going to be nice and flat for you. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Thanks, Jay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, last on the list right now, I see Vincent Stanton. Hold on just a moment. Sorry. Um, since this project was uh, designed, uh, we've had the decision uh, not to um, build any tennis courts at the new middle high school. And this is the first summer that we um, have not uh, had the, the 10 uh, courts that used to be at the high school. I wonder, in, in, and I, I can say as someone who's played over 20 times this summer, this is the first time I've ever had to wait um, to play. I'm, I've been going to Winbrook instead of the high school, which is where I used to go. And uh, I'd say over half the times, uh, there's a, at least a uh, a 10 or 15 minute wait, the longest uh, I think was uh, 40 minutes. Often, you know, several groups are, um, are waiting. Anyway, I just wondered if any thought had been given to um, reconsidering the use of that, um, the pickleball space in view of the crunch on uh, tennis courts in Belmont. So uh, Jay, if, if you could talk about um, the reconfiguration um, that somebody asked about earlier, whether we could reconfigure the, the pickleball courts to double as tennis courts. I, I will confess I am not a tennis player. I know very little about the dimensions required to play tennis, but as far as I understand, these could double as tennis courts. Is that correct? Uh, I'll have to talk to Tim Wong and um, Craig Miller, but I think that the way it's configured that they're going to be dedicated pickleball. Um, there's four dedicated pickleball courts in there. And the way that it's configured now that it's kind of painted or striped in a way that um, they can play pickleball 
um, this is just going to be right now. All the tennis courts in town are striped with um, regulation and youth regulation and then pickleball. And we, we've been getting complaints about how uh, it can be confusing sometimes. Vince, maybe you know that if, if you're a uh, frequent uh, tennis player. Um, so I can ask uh, Waterfield Design Group who did this if there was any way that, you know, we can work in some uh, tennis layout for the, you know, people that are interested in playing tennis if no one's playing pickleball. Of course, that would require taking the wall down as well. I think the wall is going to be more uh, on, on the um, Waverly side, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right, Courtney? Yeah, that's correct. The wall only goes out on the Waverly side halfway across the court. So that's not a whole division across the entirety of the both pickleball courts. It will just go across the one. So if the distance is needed, we'll have that in one vertical, right. I don't know, one length. Uh, okay. It's something we can look at, Boots, and I can reach out to you after. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because it seems to me if the wall was actually put on the side, then you could have the benefit of the wall. Um, at its, you know, at its something like its current length, but also have the benefit of, um, should it be desirable in the future, converting it to a, a, a tennis court at some point. Thanks. Mm. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions about the um, town field restoration? I think that's it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Courtney. Um, Next, we have the, uh, the Homer House window restoration project. And again, I uh, apologize here for my um, photo that I inserted. I wanted to make sure everyone was familiar with the building, um, but this does not do justice to the decrepit state of the windows, um, which is the purpose of this project. Um, the request is for $100,000. Um, the sponsor is the Belmont Women's Club. Um, here's a picture of the house. And as you'll see, I just put down at the bottom of the slide um, some of the primary goals as were listed in the application um, to restore operability of the 43 double hung windows so they are safe and allow proper ventilation in the house. Um, there are some exterior scrolls um, that need to be restored and also some rehabilitation of the glass stained glass windows and doors. So I hope you had a chance to um, look at some of this information and if there are any questions, um, please raise your hand and we will do our best to get them answered. Again, as most all of you know, um, when we actually get to town meeting, there will be more uh, in-depth uh, presentations. I think there's some slides and two to three minute presentations from the sponsors will be also given in more detail. Um, Kathy Cohane, I see your hand is up. Sorry, I was talking away on mute. Um, Kathy Cohane, Precinct 2. I know for a prior project that was approved for the Homer House, there was some stipulation um, about a way to recoup the cost in the event that the house was sold or, or some other event. Is there such a similar clause that's being uh, incorporated to, to, to this award? Um, I'm not sure. Let me see. I, I thought um, the sponsors were going to be here this evening. I don't know if Wendy or Elizabeth is here or perhaps someone else from the CPC might have an answer to that. If not, we'll be sure to get the answer for you um, before town meeting. Lori. Yep. George Hall, Town Council. Oh, thank you. Um, we've, we've been working on a historic preservation restriction on this property uh, and, and had a little bit of difficulty getting um, you know, prompt responses from the Mass Historical Commission, especially now during the pandemic. Um, but I will investigate the status of that and be able to answer that uh, more specifically at the town meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else at this stage for the um, project? Jack Weiss, I see your hands up. Jack Weiss Precinct 1, I never would have thought about that issue that Kathy just raised if uh, uh, 
is it an appropriate amendment um, to this article to make that a stipulation for the funding? Laurie, this is Steve Pinkerton. I'm on the CPC. Thank you, Steve. We, we, we discussed this at length during our, our deliberations on this project and, and a, a part of the approval of it was that the, uh, the improvements would be carried through into the deed. Um, the, the specifics on that are, I mean, that's, that's part of our approval of this. So I don't know that it needs to be stipulated uh, beyond the fact that we approved the project, but we can look into that too. Thank you. Um, Kathy, do you have another question or is this? No, and so it's a, it's a follow up. I, I, I think if, if Bob McLaughlin is on the line, um, I, I recall there was something done for the last award given to the Women's Club. Um, and so if I'm remembering it, others might too, it would be helpful to speak to that. Um, and, and if it was decided not needed for this, this grant, then to understand the rationale behind it. So I'm not against it. I just, I think there was a concern in the past about um, recouping costs in the event if the, if the building were sold for a profit, would we as the town be able to get that cost back? So. Thank you. I don't think Bob is on the call unless he's on a on phoning in, but we'll certainly follow up on this. Okay, thank you. Kathy, we, this is Steve Pinkerton again, uh, town meeting member, precinct seven. Uh, and, and member of the CPC, we, we made it very clear at, at our meetings that this was to be required. It was required of the last project uh, that was completed at, uh, at, at the house. And, uh, and we expect that this will continue to go through on that. So we'll follow up before town meeting on it, but, but it, I don't think it needs to be uh, adjudicated any further. We've, we've already pretty much made it a part okay. of the grant. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. Anything else about the Homer House project? I don't see any other hands at this point. Um, so I will move along. Um, the next one is a feasibility study at Belmont Village. Um, this falls into the community housing part of the CPC grants. The request is for $173,000. Um, and this is to look at a feasibility study for the redevelopment and creation of new affordable housing units at Belmont Village. Um, and again, I just pulled from the, um, from the application uh, some of how the success would be judged, um, looking at the site assessment and financial analysis of the redevelopment of Belmont Village, um, and looking at the design and community process that would provide options for the addition of accessible units and the creation of new affordable apartments. Um, are there any questions related to this one? Again, we'll have much more um, in-depth presentations coming up at town meeting, um, but this is the time to get questions answered. Um, so let me see, I see Kathy Cohane has her hand up. Oh, no. It's, no? Okay. I'm taking and, it uh, down, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, is your hand up? It is Jack Weiss. Um, um, can you hear me? I didn't get an unmute signal, but I may yes. have Yes, yes, perhaps break. it was. Okay, never remuted. Um, I, I raised this question, I think, when this was presented to the Warren Committee, uh, and, and I don't recall the details, but my recollection at that time was that most of this money was for the physical design. Um, after the, uh, at, at this, this study basically had two components, uh, a, a feasibility um, component and a physical design component. And most of this money was related to the physical design. And I, I just would like to make sure that the Belmont Housing Authority commits that uh, they will, you know, if, if the feasibility um, study does not bear out going forward with the creation, um, that they'll return those physical design monies and not spend them on a design that um, is likely to be in, unfeasible. Good. Somebody from the Housing Authority here speak to that or commit to that? Do we have anyone um, from the Housing Authority here? I thought um, Elizabeth might be here or if anyone else from the um, CPC can jump in for this question. Otherwise, we will make sure to get an answer for you, Jack.
I'm going to add this to my list at the moment to, to investigate. Um, so we will get back to you on that one and have it ready for town meeting. Thank you. Um, Vincent Stanton, I see your hand is up. Yes, uh, Vincent Stanton, uh, town meeting member, precinct three. I, I could uh, just uh, note vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jack's uh, question that the uh, application from the Belmont Housing Authority indicates that there are two buckets, 73,000 for um, kind of a feasibility scoping work and 100,000 for design. That I believe is what he was referring to. And the application also indicates that those are uh, sequential with the, the scoping happening first and the design later. So that doesn't answer his question as to whether, you know, if the project was deemed infeasible at the end of one, it uh, wouldn't go to two, but it, it is kind of laid out that way in the uh, application that the Belmont Housing Authority submitted to the uh, CPC. My question uh, two, I guess, the most fundamental, um, question about the feasibility in my mind is what is, is there a funding source for this uh, you know be other than the town of um, Belmont which I think would you know would have uh, a hard time bearing a, a, the cost of a, of a significant um, uh, rebuild so we I, I looked a little bit on the state uh, uh, websites and uh, found some information which generally seem to um, relate to fairly small amounts of, of money. So I, I guess my question is, what is the, uh, the range of um, options that will be considered in the feasibility study? Does it include taking down some or all of the existing housing and replacing it? Or does it mainly focus on uh, the construction of new uh, housing that would be ex accessible. That's clearly part of it, um, but it's but it's not clear whether replacing the existing units is will also be considered in the, the feasibility uh, study. And and as I say, my concern is if 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 we don't know what uh, the the source of construction funds would be, or or the majority of construction funds would be. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. Well, anyway, I, I'd like someone to address that. Thank you. Um, again, I am looking to see who is best to answer this. The, I think our sponsors tonight weren't able to join us. So I apologize for that. And we'll certainly um, have this. So we'll certainly get, get answers for you. Um, unless there's someone else from the CPC, if this had come up at your meetings earlier and are able to answer the question. All right, this, this one is on my list. Um, we will get an answer for you. Um, I also see Michael McNamara has his hand up. Hi, Michael McNamara, town meeting member, precinct seven. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great, I just wanted to mention, um, speaking of the um, affordable housing, community housing, um, we should note that we are still under the 10% threshold. Um, so I, I, would, I definitely don't wanna labor the point, but until we reach that 10% threshold of the state, um, if someone wanted to do a hostel, by which I mean the town has no input, 40B project for affordable housing, the town would have no say, really. We'd be sort of out of luck. So I think it is, well, it, there are good concerns, making sure that we keep in mind the cost and the benefit. I would, I would remind folks that um, if the town wants to have full control over its affordable housing um, and full control over what the developer can and can't do, within reason, we have to try to work to reach 10%. And this would help hopefully with some of the affordable housing issues and the, the threshold we need to have in order to have more um, self-control uh, or self-determination of, of what our affordable housing. So while we keep in mind the cost, we should also keep in mind that there's a cost for not doing this as well. Thank you. Thank you, and that's a, that's a very good point. I will just take this opportunity though to remind everyone um, I'm, there are all kinds of great points to be made about all of these issues, but I would ask everyone just to hold that until we get to town meeting. Um, again, this, this evening is really to be confined to questions 
Um, and we will try to do our best to answer them this evening, or as I said, I'm making my list of those that we'll have answers for before we get to town meeting and try to get them to you as soon as possible. Um, I see another hand up from Allison McMartin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Allison McMartin and I work for the Cambridge Housing Authority, and I actually represent Belmont Housing, so I apologize, I, I wasn't able to chime in earlier. Uh, the Housing Authority recently signed a management contract with Cambridge Housing, so we're new to the authority, um, and I am picking up this application where the former executive director left it off. Um, I think Vin Vincent covered um, one of the questions that was asked about the the buckets in the two different um, categories for the funding. Um, and then to answer the other question about, um, you know, if the feasibility of the first part, if it doesn't seem feasible, then we would, we would not move on with the second part, which is the architecture and design services. Thank you. I appreciate those responses. And um, uh, Jack, I see your Hand is up, and Vincent. So now we have that we've identified the uh, the expert here, Allison. If you could still, if you could just stand by, and I will ask these two gentlemen to uh, see if there are any further questions for you. Of course, Jack. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, Jack Weiss, Precinct One. Uh, Vincent uh, did touch on uh, one of the things I had raised at Warren Committee and, and just want to confirm that uh, when uh, the Housing Authority is doing this feasibility study, feasibility is just is not limited to physical possibility or feasibility, but it is also related to the funding and the likelihood of being able to um, actually implement the plan. And it would seem to me that it doesn't make sense to go spend $100,000 on architectural drawings if there is no certainty of funding or other aspects beyond the physical possibility of adding units. Yes, and, and that's a good point to make. And, and I do want to mention um, it, the timing is good with Cambridge Housing coming in because we have a lot of experience and have redeveloped several um, projects uh, across the state with different types of funding. So we have, um, you know, a whole arsenal of folks in our camp that specialize in um, coming up with creative solutions for funding. Um, so, so it is a good time. And of course, you know, if it's not going to happen money-wise, there's no point in spending the money um, to not get the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vincent, would you like to uh, follow up with any questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, Vincent Stanton, Precinct 3. Uh, I got the impression from the, um, the application that this was intentionally, that, that the feasibility study was intentionally described broadly um, so that it, it could cover a wide range of possibilities. But if you could, uh, uh, let us know whether that might include, for example, uh, tearing down uh, some of the existing uh, houses and um, and replacing them with more modern uh, construction. Um, I would yeah, I'd be interested to know the answer to that. A, a second question would be whether the, the the creative financing that you refer to. I'm assuming some that that includes uh, state funds. Do, are there also federal funds available for this type of project? So two questions. Thank you. So um, I don't have a lot of details, but I do imagine that the redevelopment would include demolishing some, if not all, well, not all initially um, of the existing um, buildings and creating new construction. Um, the second option or question, and I can have more information about this at the town meeting, um, there are federal funds that exist. So that is another option that we could um, go after. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's all the, um, the questions I see relating to um, the Belmont Village project. So let's move along now to um, the police station exterior stairs. Uh, as I mentioned, this came in recently. This is a request for $100,000. 
um, related to historic preservation. Um, the DPW and Belmont Police Department build a committee with the sponsors, um, and there are many pictures. I believe in the application. This is this is just one to give you some grounding, but there are many that show the um, the problems with the stairs. Um, and I think I'll let uh, Anthony perhaps describe this in more detail. But it seems as though while this project is underway, this is the ideal time to take this last step to finish it off. Um, but if you have a few more words, and then we can open it up for questions. Sure. I mean, I think your final comment was the was really the the uh kind of the, the core of this. Um, so uh, the building committee is actually very excited about the project. Uh, we've, uh, we're very pleased with the progress. We have a great design team. We have a great contractor. Um, we've done a lot of work um, and we are seeking funds right now to ensure that we can complete the project. So in earlier rounds of funding, the scope of work included some cosmetic uh, repairs, you know, so uh, mainly surface level repairs to the front stairs. Um, but with an active police station at the time we were, we were organizing all of the, the earlier proposals, there was no way to actually dig in and uh, uh, we didn't have the expertise to think about what, what the underlying structure might look like. Um, this building was built in 1931. We've already encountered some interesting surprises. Um, and so what we, what we hope to do with this, with, this, uh, with this money is lift the treads that you see there in the stairs and start digging into the underlying structure, make sure everything is sound, repair anything we find. Um, we are not doing that, we are not starting that disruptive testing until we know we have the funds in place to repair it. Um, I do wanna emphasize that uh, we have been looking at different scenarios for what we might find when we actually start the work. Um, and the Estimates are, pro are looking to be in the fifty dollars to $75,000 range. We are, we are still asking for $100,000 because we want, need to make sure that we have the contingency. But it is our hope that we will come in at the you know, middle to low end of the, of the range and the remaining funds will be returned to the CPC for the, uh, you know, in their, in their uh, reserve funds. Um, that's all I have Great. to say. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, are there any questions about this project? So please raise your hand. Uh, Jack Weiss. Jack Weiss, Precinct One, apologies folks. Um, Anthony, um, I think it was CPC funds that were previously used for window restoration. Um, from what you know, is this the last unfunded component or portion of this project? Um, and the last time um, the building committee will be coming back to the CPA in town meeting for additional funds um, to complete work? This is the last thing that we know of that, uh, that, um, that, that we will be coming back for. Um, we've taken care of with CPA funds, the window, some of the, uh, the masons, mason repairs for the, for the main original building. Um, some additional funds. Uh, if Mike Smith is on the on the line, he can he can jump in with a bit of that. Um, the new wing, of course, is its own is its own thing, uh, coming along nicely. Um, we've done a lot of site work. This is really the remaining the remaining piece. And I should emphasize also that uh, if we don't do it now, um, we will have to do repairs frequently, and eventually we're going to have to rebuild them. It's going to be cheaper, much more cost effective to do it now while we have the contractors, while we have the design team, and while the police are not in the building. But this is it, yes. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Vincent Stanton, I see your hand is raised. Vincent Stanton, Precinct 3. Um, I would just note that uh, we still have a, uh, a fence uh, at the top and the bottom of the stairs that lead to the library because um, that repair was paid for, executed, and then um, failed. So um, <laughs> getting these things right is uh, maybe more complicated than um, it first appears. I just note that for context, the second thing is, uh, Within 350 feet of these stairs are two other stairs that are in vastly worse condition, leaving aside the, um, the BMLD stairs, which no one uses. 
the stairs leading up to the uh, north train platform at Belmont Center Station have um, gigantic, uh, uh, like an inch and a half wide in some places, gaps, uh, and um, are not level and are the, the, the retaining, uh, the concrete retaining structure on either side is, uh, is disintegrating and in pieces. So I, I don't know if there's any uh, thought to, to synergies, but there are, there are, there are stairs in far worse repair with, within 350 feet of these. Uh, thank you for your comment, and I, and I don't mean to keep um, believing, yes. but um, please let's stick to questions. They're all excellent points, but there'll be plenty of opportunity for such comments um, at the town meeting. It is an excellent point, and I would just emphasize, uh, you know, another reason to do this right now is I have seen the work that, that, the, that the design team and the contractor have done so far. It is complicated to get these things right. This is the right team. Great, thank you. Um, Kathy Gohane, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, so just a comment. I think, uh, you know, part of the problem at the library was that it's a fake berm and the, and the creek goes underneath. So my question here is, have we, do we understand what the underlying conditions are um, and that there isn't something lurking underneath the steps that uh, would would cause the repair to fail or to cost more. So that's a good question. Um, we the reason that the reason this wasn't included originally is because we didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and now the reason why we have a hundred thousand dollar cap is we're looking at worst case scenarios because until we start taking things apart, we don't actually know. What I can tell you is, you know, while the police have had to re you know, repair the steps, you know, with greater free levels of frequency in recent years, um, they're still in pretty good shape for, for a 90 year old stairs. So I think if there was something truly, you know, like what's going on over at the, at the library, if there was something like that, I would think it would have shown up earlier. Yeah. Um, okay. But it's a, the point is well taken. We found other things in the soils, you know, okay. landfill we didn't expect. <laughs> Yeah. I see Steve. I see Steve Dorrance has his hand up. Lori, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. So um, I'm familiar with this stair issue and would like to add a little bit of context. Great. Thank uh, you. Particularly given Kathy's uh, uh, question. So Anthony has uh, framed this correctly, and the ask is for 100K, which I think covers the worst case scenario. Facilities has repaired these stairs at least twice in the last three years. The cosmetic, uh, and all we've done, frankly, Laurie, is cosmetic repairs because of the operating budget. We can't afford to do the job right, and the job right is going to be a substantial rebuilding of these stairs and the money that the building committee and Anthony is lobbying for is the right amount of money to deal with the likely underlying infrastructure issues of the stairs. What we're looking at is the slabs on the front of the stairs, but if we had a side view of the stairs, we can see that the bricks are bulging and that has to be fixed and that suggests that there's water infiltration in the core, the center of the stairs. So the ask I think fixes these once and for all for you know another 50 years. So that's always dangerous to put a timeline on it. But the, the point is it's a permanent fix for the foreseeable future. Great, thank you very much. That was also very helpful. Any other questions at this point for the the stair project here? I don't see any, so I'm gonna move along to, um, to the phase two of the emergency rental assistance program. Um, this is the last, I believe, for article four. Um, as you will recall, um, in June of the Junetown meeting, $250,000 was approved for this project. 
um, and I'm going to see, um, I know Betsy Lipson sent some slides along, so uh, if there are any um, comments you'd like to make uh, at this stage, uh, Betsy, or if there are any particular questions, um, please raise your hand. Lori, can you hear me? This is Betsy. Yes. Hi, and Lori also just thank you so much for all your work on this. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Betsy Lipson. I'm co-chair of the Housing Trust and also um, town meeting member Precinct 6. Um, and I want to clarify just one thing, Lori, that um, the funding we received um, or worked on for phase one was um, funding we had already been granted by town meeting. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we came before town meeting in June for expanded um, authorized use of $250,000 for the emergency rental assistance program. Um, and you might recall at that point, we were doing, you know, a guesstimate. Um, we all read the same news and hear the same stories that there has been an income cliff um, for many people with COVID. So on the Housing Trust, we are quite familiar with the demographics in town and um, knowing that a lot of people in town are already cost burdened um, outside of COVID, we anticipated that there would be a number of people um, um, intensely affected by the pandemic. So the um, $250,000 phase one um, is still in process and recognizing that the special application is um, time sensitive because of town meeting, we needed to come in with this phase two application, um, knowing that just based on the, um, the number of applications that came in to phase one, the number of inquiries, the number of emails um, that we are potentially and likely going to exceed that um, $250,000 in terms of need. Um, so this funding request from the CPA is um, really like an envelope, if you think of it opening up. If it's needed, we're going to use it. If it's not needed, it goes back to the town. And the way we have um, structured this is exactly like you're familiar with from the first phase. So the program details on the right column are exactly what they were in first phase. Um, and in this one with 100,000, um, we're guesstimating we might serve 25 to 30 additional Belmont households. The reason it's a range is, as you can see from the fourth bullet on the right, the payment amounts vary by bedroom size. Um, and many of you may be interested in preliminary data on the first phase just to get a sense of what's going on there. And so that there's some bullets in the bottom left um, quadrant indicating we, we got 69 applications by the deadline. Um, and just to back that up a little bit, we had a, a huge push over three weeks to quickly advertise this. And a, a number of you were involved in that process. Um, so if you're a landlord, you received um, a snail mail letter from us Include, which included a flyer that um, we asked you to deliver to your tenant. Um, it also went out through Belmont Light in, um, in billing envelopes through snail mail as well as through electronic um, means on, on Belmont Light and on you know, a number of other um, platforms. So we felt like we kind of saturated, um, but in fact, a lot of the people who we are trying to reach um, you know, they may not have internet or they may not have um, quick access to responding to an online application that requires um, internet and is um, and some tech savvy, right? You have to be able to pull your documents together, take pictures of them, upload or scan documents for the online application. Um, we do know that um, more applicants came in than we projected we have would have funds for. So we did conduct a lottery. And in particular, we did the lottery because you might remember, we're prioritizing those with lower incomes. So it was important to do a lottery in that way too. And then um, our, um, our administrator, the Metro West Collaborative Development is really carefully going through um, each application to ensure all documents are there and then to help households that haven't pulled together the documents to complete their applications. Um, and to make sure everybody's eligible, right? We have pretty strict uh, document requirements on eligibility. This has to be income loss due to COVID. Um, what we know is most applicants are in two to three bedroom homes, and we know that um, most are in households with three to four people. Um, 
and I will say, you know, the notice went out by the Belmont schools. Thank you, Belmont schools. It went out at like 1040 on a Monday morning and our program administrator um, had the phone ringing off the hook in the next hour. So we are definitely hitting a need. Um, Lori, I don't know if you want me to go through all the slides here, or just this one slide. I, I, I think that's a very good overview um, because as, as I said, we, there's gonna be a chance to, to go through the full presentation at town meeting. So um, if you can just stand by, if we have questions, I think that would be great. Uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand. Um, let me see, Michael McNamara, I see your hands up. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Michael McNamara, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 7. Um, I just wanted to ask Betsy, um, or Mrs., um, sorry, I didn't catch your last name. Uh, that's fine, Betsy Lipson. Sure, uh, Mrs. Lipson, um, uh, I wanted to ask, how many Belmont residents, in, in what you data you can see, um, are rent burdened? I think that would be very important to know because we may have even a larger um, need than we may initially think I wanted to know. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Michael, thank you. Um, you know, I'm actually going to back up and say, um, since um, uh, in the Boston area, we have one of the nation's best um, area planning councils. They run data on all of this kind of thing. So the Metropolitan Area Planning Council um, reviewed data from May on unemployment claims and then matched that up in an analysis with, um, with household um, uh, mortgage or rent um, payment projections. And they anticipate for Belmont specifically um, 195 households will need rental assistance. That was, you know, May, so hopefully people are finding work since then, but it just gives you a sense. That's pretty, that's a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jack Weiss, I see your hands up. Um, my question, and I guess it follows up uh, a little bit uh, with that comment that you just made. Um, Betsy, my recollection from back in June was that we always knew and always anticipated that the need uh, may very well exceed the 250,000. Um, my question, I think, is really one of confirmation to the CPC committee. Um, and this is a discussion that we've had in the Warren Committee, but I just want to confirm and make sure the town meeting members are aware that the CPC committee is not recommending these projects. They are not doing an analysis about what the opportunity cost of contributing money to this uh, cause or project might be relative to other projects. Um, their um, review is is merely limited to whether or not the project meets the requirements of the program and they leave it entirely to town meeting with no guidance whatsoever to decide whether or not this is a good use of money relative to future projects that aren't on the table now um, yeah Jack, Elizabeth, or great... is somebody is that is that um, a, a fair characterization Is there, if someone from the CPC want to chime in, that, that's been my understanding, but we should certainly have that confirmed. I don't know if, um, I know Steve Pinkerton talked about, it. I think Peg Veely might be on the call. Um, Jack, could, I can... you could you repeat the question, Jack? Sure. Um, my understanding, and uh, I would love- I got lost in your long, your, your, your preamble to it. So That's just, okay. Uh, my understanding, and I would love confirmation, is that the CPC committee uh, makes no value judgment as to the worthiness of the projects. They merely opine on whether they are legally permitted, and they leave it entirely to town meeting members with no guidance to decide whether or not uh, the opportunity cost of this project versus future projects that aren't on the table now uh, is a good use of money. There, there's, it's hard to guide people on the basis of projects that are out on the, not on the table and out in the future without knowing what they are. But nonetheless, that's, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. We are, are, the committee is, the charge is to, uh, to uh, make sure that they're eligible for funding and to bring them to town meeting. It's town meeting's job to approve these. 
Yeah, Jack, that's a good point. This is Betsy. As you know, because I think you've heard the Housing Trust say this um, many times, our objective is very much to build more affordable housing. So, you know, to um, beat a dead horse with this word, but these are unprecedented times. We're doing this to help our neighbors and to remind, you know, all the town meeting members, the funds that are provided here, they're going, in, they're going to landlords. We're not providing cash to a renter. Um, and landlords, of course, pay property taxes. Um, and I will say, you know, as soon as possible, the Housing Trust is excited to get back to um, using CPC funds for affordable housing. Thank you both. And thank you, Steve. Are there any other questions about um, Article 4? Uh, if not, let's move along now to, um, to Article 5, which is um, to transfer $320,000 from the water retained earnings to purchase the modular units that are being used by the police station project. Um, and here again, just wanted to give you a, a couple of photos to um, illustrate that these are really substantial um, units. I, I think the office, you can see with the police chief here, um, are, is, is very substantial. And the, the need here, or the, um, the need is to alleviate severe uh, space constraints for the public works departments. And then there's a domino effect on other departments. But here I think I'll ask Patrice um, if you would give some more background other than my one minute introduction there and explain this in more detail, please. Sure, thanks, Laurie. So the town has an opportunity to purchase the modular office units currently being used by the police station located at the Public Works Department. The town has made lease payments of approximately $97,000 or 13 payments of $7,500 as of um, August 27, 2020. The town has at least five remaining payments totaling $37,000 to be paid. If the town decides to purchase the modulars, any remaining payments would cease and the negotiated price to purchase the trailers is $320,000, which will be paid out of the Water Enterprise Fund. The town has been very creative over the years in maximizing its spaces. However, these spaces are at capacity. The town has already invested significant funds for these modular units, and to start from scratch could possibly be three to four times more expensive uh, than purchasing the modular units as they sit. So the opportunity to maximize the savings by purchasing these trailers is now. And um, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, any questions about Article 5? Please raise your hand. Uh, let me get to the top of the list here. Um, Anne-Marie Lambert, I see your hand is up. Hi, Anne-Marie uh, Lambert, uh, Precinct 8. Uh, could somebody speak to the um, opportunity cost of what we would be using these funds for uh, if we weren't purchasing modular units, which seems to have nothing to do with water. Jay, I don't know if you wanted to answer that. Sorry, Emory, can you repeat the question? What would we be doing with these funds that's related, that the Water Enterprise Fund was, uh, uh, has been put in place to fund? Uh, it seems like purchasing modular units it has nothing to do with water or anything that the Water Enterprise Fund was uh, aimed at addressing. And I'd just like to understand what the opportunity cost is of transferring these funds over from one purpose to another. So the plan was to use the um, retained earnings from the Water Enterprise Funds. It is on water department property in, like Patrice had said, we have already spent significant funds to clear the area up, set up the modular units themselves. Um, we may, there's a parking lot there already. There's fencing, there's gate access. So there's already some significant in, um, investment from the, from the town um, and put in place for these things. The opportunity that we saw was that, you know, the, the water department building we we just went over it this morning. It's 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 old. It's like in you know built in the '60s. It's it definitely needs a new roof. The um, we have 
landscaping issues. We have office space issues that we have. Um, it's Jay? not. Yes. I don't think uh, I'm being clear with my question. Um, so we're using it to to have a space for uh, water department staff um, in the near future. We we already have a major wa uh, water leak in the roof. We're, we're using that to um, have future space for the water department and even water department uh, functions, uh, like support functions, to go there. Like I could go down there. Um, and what what are there. what is the water enterprise fund usually used for? What does it have a no, description? No, no. So the the, the water enterprise fund is yeah. based on water consumption rates. I know where it comes from, but what is its purpose? I'm not understanding your question. The retained earnings is used to for capital investments, like water main projects, um, the uh, smart meter program, stuff like that. This okay. would, if we have to get a new building, we would use retained earnings for that. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, if we have to do, so the water department owns that building. The town, the general fund does not, like the facilities department in the town does, has nothing to do with that building. It's all, all the maintenance and upkeep of that building comes out of the water department. So if we were to do any major capital investment to that building, it would come out of retained earnings. So the money that we're using for these modules is coming from retained earnings. Does that make sense? So it's coming from the, the money to purchase modular units is coming from the same fund that would be used to purchase a building for the water department. Yes. Did I get that Capital. right? Thank that you. is Capital. correct. And it's also the same fund that would be used for water main projects and smart meter and so forth. Yes. That Thank is you. correct. Thank this you. is um, a proactive approach to um, an issue and a problem we see. Um, in the future or the near future, um, for, you know, the, for the water department. For the water department, and use of the water makes sense at this moment. Though we acknowledge that um, another use could emerge over time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jean. Jean Mooney, I saw your hand go up and down. Here we go. If you have a question, please. No, thank you, Anne Maria. That was the very question I had. I just and thank you for clarifying that it's actually the the use of the trailers will be for water department people. Yeah. It'll be used for water department or any department that supports water department, such as the GPW. For okay. example, one of the um, one of the the needs um, in the town is obviously there's a lot of space needs. So if uh, the for example the water uh, the Dep Department of Public Work offices that are currently housed at the Homer building moved down there, it would free up some space in um, the Homer building. Okay, so this doesn't impact any um, water main replacement or are, are we dipping into funds um, at all that, um, that would need to be used um, for other, other repairs or, or water main issues? No, this is this is Jay Marcotte. No, um, we did the smart meter program alongside with our water main capital program. Um, it's just the planned use of retained earnings. That's okay. how we um, use use it. And are there other funds? What what's remained in the water retained? We're taking three twenty from the retained earnings. What's remaining in that fund after use of these? So right now, I know that we have about one point two million. That being said, I. I'm waiting for our certified um, free cash at the, we usually get that at the end of October. Um, my projections is that we're looking at uh, four to $400,000, dollars in um, additional revenue that um, we received um, over our operating uh, budget. Okay, so, so we're reducing by 320 for this, but I'm anticipating we have to certify uh, free cash in October that I'm going to add another 450 to 500. That makes so, sense. Uh, yeah, so you'll be back up to, you said you currently had one point something million. So I, uh, I think it'd just be useful to maybe perhaps um, have some financial figures for, so people understand what's currently in the fund, where this is going, and perhaps, um, more importantly, um, how often are funds put into the um, water retained um, uh, earnings fund? Thank you. Yeah, the, the only thing I would say to that, Gene, is um, we don't have certified free cash or retained earnings yet. So anything that would be for FY20 would be an, um, an estimate. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, not seeing any other at this point for Article 5, so I'm going to move along now to um, Article 6. Uh, and these, this one and Article 7 are really transferring some um, relatively small uh, remaining balances. Um, this Article 6 really relates to the water capital balances. Um, Jay, if you're still there, and can give a little bit of an overview, but I, I see this more as a housekeeping, perhaps, um, type yeah. of article. Yeah, so um, we have uh, prior year capital um, savings that is in the amount of, I don't have the number in front of me, it's like 137,000. Yeah. All that money. 137,641 yes. 641 is the total I have here. Yes, and so all that money is gonna go towards the FY21 uh, water main uh, capital project. Uh, that was, we, we had planned on that um, from the beginning with the, these funds. And it's just going to go towards that uh, once the uh, funds get uh, reallocated. Thank you. Are there any questions about this one, Article Six? Sewer. I'm not seeing anything, so I'm going to go to Sewer, Article Seven. Uh, same same thought process. Uh, we have prior year capital uh, savings, and it's twenty five thousand and. Help me out with the specific. Five thousand five eighty one and twenty cents. All right, excellent. And Glenn Clancy's um, stormwater and sewer uh, repair capital line item uh, will be receiving that money. Thank you. Are there any questions about uh, this one or the uh, transfer for the? Water? I'm not seeing anything. I think these are relatively straightforward. Oh, I see Anne Marie Lambert. I just wanted. Uh, confirm that the the water and the sewer are separate funds? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, let's move along now to Article 8. Um, I think this one is another one that's uh, relatively straightforward, some housekeeping here to uh, clean up some grammar in the zoning. Um, I know Steve Pinkerton is, uh, is here. Um, and I think this is just to uh, state the intent of the bylaw more clearly. Again, in all the materials that were sent out to town meeting members, this was described in much more detail. I just tried to put up on the screen what the new language would read. Um, but Steve, if there's any other background you would like to um, add at this point, or if anyone has any questions about Article 8. Thank you, Laurie. This is Steve Pinkerton, Chair of the Planning Board. Um, this is a, a, a very simple housekeeping matter. It's something that we promised that we would do a couple of years ago, uh, came from Robert McGaw, the, of the, uh, and the and the warrant committee, uh, just clarifying some language to make it a, a, to, to change things from a negative and a positive to a positive and a an, negative, basically, <laughs> um, and it and it just clears up the language. It just says that unless the building commissioner determines that alterations uh, 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 comply with, with the clauses, the special permit will be required from the uh, board of appeals. So. Thank you. It wasn't that clear before, and now it is much clearer. That's all there is to it. Terrific. Thank you. Are there any, I don't see any hands up um, about Article 8. So we're going to move along now. I'm looking at the clock. It's 8.30, so hopefully, as I said, we can um, clean things up uh, no later than 9 o'clock. So Article 9, this is the uh, amending the zoning bylaw um, for the McLean District three zone three overlay. Um, as I said, I know there are uh, much longer presentations. Um, the session that was given on Tuesday at the planning board meeting that is all available at Belmont Media if you want a full um, presentation and the discussion that followed. Um, but I don't know if there were remaining questions or if um, Steve, there's a way that you can give a, a, a very uh, broad overview here or the but again, we were really thinking that we would take any any remaining questions um, after the sessions earlier this week, um, now would be the time to, to raise them. That sounds good, Laurie. I, we, it's Steve Pinkerton, uh, Chair of the Planning Board. Um, we did do a presentation on Tuesday and that presentation is up on the Planning Board website. So in addition to the Belmont Media live presentation, you can, can read it at your leisure uh, from the uh, Planning Board website. Um, basically, this project has a two-year history, and it actually has a 20-year history because it goes back to the original 
uh, formulation for what was going to happen in uh, zone three in the McLean district. Uh, zone three was designated as a senior living district and it had, the plan was to install and uh, to build a uh, an 800, uh, sorry, 486 unit continuing care uh, retirement community, uh, basically for the senior living district. Um, and that didn't come through to fruition. McLean Hospital came back to us a couple of years ago with an alternate plan that would have basically instead installed a much uh, smaller project, uh, developed a much smaller project with 40 townhouses um, and 110 uh, uh, apartment flats, all of them condominiums, uh, basically senior directed. Uh, that didn't get very far uh, in, in the initial uh, public hearings we had. It, it, uh, the project was revised substantially and now we've got something that's much more uh, viable, it seems to me. Um, and, and more, more universally appealing. We've got senior housing, uh, we've got uh, multifamily housing. Uh, there are affordable units um, that uh, will help increase our uh, subsidized housing inventory uh, by 116 units. So it's a, it's a, it's a long standing, uh, we've been working on this for a long time and uh, we've gotten input from uh, everybody in town. I mean, we, this has been one of the most open processes that we've, I've, I've been experienced uh, and have been involved in. Um, not un inconsistent with the 20 year, uh, the, the history that uh, 20 years ago when they developed the memorandum of agreement with McLean in the first place. So we're, we're piling onto that. I'll, I'll shut up and go for questions. No, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I see one hand up. Kate Bowen, do you have a question? Uh, yes, Scott, Kate Bowen, Precinct 4, town meeting member. Um, a quick question. I don't think I've seen it in any of the plans. Um, if you can provide some uh, information about the pedestrian access uh, from the site to Town Center and Waverly Square, uh, I guess Pleasant Street would be included in that as well. I have not seen that, and so apologies if it's there. I am wondering about the pedestrian access for that site. Pedestrian access is via a sidewalk uh, that comes down um, Olmstead Drive. Olmstead Drive is a private uh, road. Uh, it's part of the McLean uh, property and it would be maintained and uh, uh, by, by uh, it's owned and, and would be maintained by McLean. Um, the um, the, two, the, two the roadway goes street. into Waverly Square. It's about a five minute walk. Um, there's, there's, that's, that's pretty much what the pedestrian access is. So was there any access considered that would connect more directly to Belmont Center? If uh, uh, geographically, that would require going across. Uh, so, so you, can, you can do it by going down to Pleasant Street and walking to uh, the center from uh, along South Pleasant Street. That would be the way to do it. Otherwise, you're, you're basically cutting across public conservation land and we'd have a problem with that, I think. Lori? Yes. This is Jeffrey Wheeler speaking. Can I also add to that? Yes, please. Yes, good evening. Um, in relation to the pedestrian question, this also goes to, the bis to bicycles as well. During the design and site plan review process, the planning board has the ability to look at pedestrian access and bicycle access, not only to Waverly Square and Pleasant Street, but also to the surrounding open space uh, the Lone Tree Hill open space as well. So it is something that can be discussed, should be discussed, I expect it to be discussed during the design and site plan review uh, phase that the planning board will conduct. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, business 10, I see your hands up. Thank you, Vincent Stanton, <clears throat> uh, Precinct 3. Uh, I recall there was also a discussion at uh, planning board meetings about the developer providing a, um, a subsidy that could be used uh, to provide bus service. Um, we should keep in mind that although the distance may be relatively short, uh, it, it's pretty steep and if it's not uh, if the sidewalks are not uh, adequately cleared after a storm, could you know could be could be dangerous, could be difficult to pass. So is is and again maybe I'm just missing it, but is the uh, subsidy for uh, some kind of 
um, bus service to Waverly Square and perhaps other destinations like Belmont Center, still part of the plan. There, this is Steve Pinkerton, uh, chair of the planning board. I don't recall that there was ever a discussion of a subsidy. Uh, there was talk of, of, of uh, providing uh, shuttle bus service as a traffic mitigation uh, effort. And also, of course, there's an interest in, in, in trying to do something about the fact that it's a hill, but um, that we're, there was never a discussion of a subsidy. The developer did look into various um, shuttle bus options, basically, uh, in, in a practical sense, we're really talking about a shuttle bus that would go up and down the hill. Um, the experience that, for example, the Royal Belmont had is that they offered shuttle service from the Royal Belmont to Belmont Center and abandoned it very quickly because nobody was riding it. Um, this is, of course, a smaller development. It's about the half the size. Um, and, and a lot of it will be, uh, well, there'll be 40 units of owned township, uh, townhouses, I'm sorry. So we're talking about 110 apartment units. Uh, Perhaps some people would be using it to go down the hill, up the hill, um, but it's it's it, it's a very difficult um, uh, uh, problem in in the sense that it doesn't lend itself very well to sh to shuttle service. Since it isn't something that's required to meet the traffic monitoring and mitigation agreement, um, we basically table it. It's something that we can bring up again at, during design and site plan review. Um, but bear in mind, this, this the cost of this has to be bear, borne somewhere. Um, and it would ultimately fall on the shoulders of the, the residents of the, of the building and it's in, in form of rents, essentially. Um, so it, it seems a, a bit premature to be talking about um, providing shuttle service for a, a, a residence that doesn't have any occupants. Um, so basically, as, as Jeffrey said, this is something that will come up again in design site plan review, but it's not something that's in the zoning article. Could I ask a, a quick uh, follow-up? Sure. Yeah. So I, t I take uh, I take your your point and the the Royal Belmont experience is um, instructive. I, I guess the uh, the lesson would seem to be that we need a um, a more comprehensive um, intra Belmont transportation system to kind of justify um, you know the cost of of moving people from. Uh, a variety of uh, relatively low user situations, um, but where collectively there might be a higher use. So is, the, is, is that something that the planning board would uh, look at at a later stage, or is that really beyond the scope of what the planning board could ask for since it's really, um, it's more than this developer should be expected to provide. It's, it's more of a, of a Belmont solution as opposed to a solution for this specific project. Thank you. Vince. How, do we, how, do we, how do we address that kind of problem? I guess that's what I'm asking. Just to answer, thank you, Vince. That's, that's a, a really good comment, actually. This is Steve Pinkerton, chair of the planning board. Um, it, it is, it is in, in, it, because it, it, it involves multiple uh, potential users, it really is beyond the scope of the planning board. It's, a, it's an interesting exercise that we should go through. This is really something that I think uh, is already under somewhat of uh, an investigation. I, I think community development has, has been in talks with LexBus at some point, or Lex, whatever that the Lexington bus is. We also have the Elder, Belder bus, which is, is, is potentially, in, in some sense, something that could be uh, knitted into this, but this is a community-wide problem. I think you're, you're absolutely the right to point that out. It's not just uh, the McLean uh, property. It's, it's all over town, essentially, that, uh, that this need needs to be brought up with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised about um, Article 9, so I will now move on to um, Article 10, which is the final one here. Um, this is to remove uh, from civil service, the police and fire. Um, I'll ask Patrice if um, she's available to, get, to give an overview. Um, again, there was a, a large discussion about this issue last night. Um, so this is really just a chance if anyone has any further questions. Um, and similarly, um, Belmont Media will have the presentation last night and all the, the questions and answers and discussion um, is available there. Sure. Thank you, Lori. So as you, as you stated, the town did a presentation last night um, and we're currently in the process of tweaking that presentation based on some of the comments and questions uh, that we received and also to address some of the misstatements that we feel 
um, were put out there. We want to make sure and ensure that the town meeting has a complete set of facts to make the decision um, to leave civil service. So what is civil service? Simply just civil service is, um, was created in 1884. Uh, it was a state law primarily to protect hiring and discipline from patronage and political interference. Belmont adopted civil service in 1915. The currently civil service includes Belmont police officers, patrol and supervisors, and Belmont firefighters. Employees currently covered under civil service remain covered, so they'd be grandfathered in even uh, if town meeting votes to leave civil service. So we're asking um, town meeting to vote to remove the town from civil service. We're asking this because we feel there are a lot of benefits that we went over um, in depth last night, but some main points are, it is very costly to the town of Belmont. It is archaic and a bureaucratic system. It, we, the town currently has collective bargaining agreements and comprehensive personnel policies that work a lot better than a system that was created over a hundred years ago. It limits the applicant pool. It's hard to hire the most desirable applicants. It's inefficient in hiring and promotional processes. And these are all things that we went into last night. So I, I don't wanna re, 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 um, relitigate what we did last night in terms of how, why we think the town should be removed from civil service. I will say that one of the, the main things that we hope to, um, to really iron out for town meeting is the idea that um, that the civil service system is transparent. We feel that it is absolutely non-transparent and we will actually get into those reasons um, once we flesh, have an opportunity to flesh that out a little bit more. And uh, good question. Thank you. I think we have uh, three questions at this point. Um, first off, Ellen Sugarman. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I attended the presentation last night and I came away and I realized I'm a little unclear. I believe that there is a union or maybe unions for the fire department and the police department. And there's also civil service. Um, is that correct? I'm, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. Okay, the reason I'm asking is because it wasn't clear to me, there were lots of things talked about and you know, this would happen and that and whatever. What is it that, that comes from the union and what is it that comes from civil service? So in other words, if they went out of civil service, what do they have from the union that they would still continue to have? And you know, that I'm trying to understand the distinction. Yeah. Jamie, do you want to try taking that? I'll try. Uh, hi, uh, James McIsaac, Belmont Police Chief. Um, the, uh, I guess, Ellen, we guess, so we have union uh, employees that are part of civil service. The civil service provides a mechanism for hiring, promoting, and sometimes provides an avenue if the officer or the firefighter chooses to, to uh, act as an arbiter in disciplinary purposes. Now you don't necessarily have to be in a union to be in civil service. Prior to 2003, the police chief in Belmont was a union position. Um, that came out of the union at that time. And like uh, acting chief Wayne Haley, when he was the assistant chief and assistant chief Mark Hurley at the Belmont Police Department. And when I was the assistant chief, we were not covered by civil service in those positions. So I guess, um, the there, there are uh, some instances where if we move from if we move out of civil service, the present police officers and firefighters will remain in civil service. They will have civil civil service status. If one of those employees unfortunately gets laid off, they will go on a civil service layoff list, which will put them ahead on another community's hiring list. Um, they those. Same employees will have the ability to uh, have civil service here, any um, complaints regarding discipline. New hires will not have the ability to go to civil service for um, discipline. They won't have the uh, 
uh, the availability to take uh, to participate in a layoff list. However, both, I'm, not, I'm going to speak only for the police um, unions. Both police unions have uh, strong language regarding just cause, uh, progressive discipline, and so forth that opens up any discipline or any uh, removal from, from positions to uh, third party arbitration, an arbiter that's agreed upon by both the uh, union and the town. So, you know, um, it, it's, um, you know, I, I, I want to be careful because I don't want to start a debate here tonight, but that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'm not looking for debate. I'm just trying to understand so, what they get from the union. Yeah. Civil service, if you, if you currently right now, if you want to be hired as a Belmont police officer or a Belmont firefighter, you have to... Uh, use civil service as the mechanism to get hired. You have to take the entrance mm -hmm. exam through civil service. And as, an, as a department that's, that's adopted civil service, we have to adhere to all their uh, personnel rules in hiring and um, in, in promoting. We have to follow the civil service, which is actually law. Um, it's a civil service law. Let me put it a different way then. Let's say that you do leave civil service but the union still exists. What services come from the union? The, un the union would absolutely exist. And yeah. the union, if you've heard uh, the town administrator talk about it, even moving forward, any change that's proposed by uh, either, you know, management at the police or management at the fire, any change in working conditions, terms of employment need to be negotiated um, with the unions. And all those negotiations are also, uh, I believe so, depending on, I don't want to get into the difference between impact bargaining and, and bargaining within um, the successor agreements, but usually they're, they're, they're open to uh, third party uh, arbitration as well. So there are protections and services from the union. I do. Yeah, I, th I think to, yeah. to go a little further with that, Ellen, um, Back in 1884, when this law was established, there were no collective bargaining un units at the time. So the unions kind of formed over time, and now the unions really offer the protections for the employees where civil service, you know, kind of started. Okay. Thanks. I was just trying to understand the different roles of the two. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, Judith, finally, let's see your hands up. How can I tell if it's up? Oh, there we go. Yes. Can, can you, you want to ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. There has been, in the course of all this discussion, some discussion about the need for diversity. And I wonder if Officer Peltrine, if he's here tonight, might talk about the composition of the current police department, I think it is exceedingly diverse. And that, of course, is would be the result of the civil service. Um, I can, I, I, go ahead. I can, I can go, I, you know, Laurie, I, it, I, I really like to hear Officer Peltrine. I, I, I just wanted to make a point that Police Chief McIsaac and Acting Chief Wayne Haley are very well versed in, in the makeup of their department. I quite understand that, but I would still like to hear Officer Peltrine. Uh, that, that would be Officer Pelrine, who's uh, a- Pelrine, I do beg your pardon. And I, I don't think he's on, but um, I, uh, he gave a pretty, I, I, I think you probably heard him last night and I would say his, um, what he referenced was accurate. And I think it's all depends on uh, what kind of diversity, you know, um, that, that we're looking for. I mean, we're all different in our own ways, but, um, you know. Well, let, let me go at this a little differently then. The reason I wanted to hear him and thought it would be worth hearing him again was that I was very pleasantly surprised at the level of diversity that there is. And that is, of course, necessarily because of the way we are set up now, that is a function of the civil service. Thank you. I don't see him well, on the call, but you can look it's, back. It's, I think a it's a function of civil service, but it's really a roll of the dice. 
because okay. um, with the exception of Sergeant Hurley and Sergeant Sparks, who were hired back in 1996, I believe it was 96, under a consent decree for an all-female list, um, those, uh, you know, those, um, those days are gone at civil service. I would also like to add that it's the future hiring, too, that is the issue here um, moving forward. Well, it, it's very much the issue as we consider whether we really want to leave civil service or not. Right, and, and what we're finding... We, have, we do not, at the present time, have any definite, even a definitive outline from uh, as to how this would be set up in the future. We don't have definitive costs. Um, it would take... You know, the, the, all we have is, well, we can do this, we might do that. But to leave civil service, we need to know, at least have a, an outline as to what might be done. Well, I, I think um, in speaking for the current system, the civil service system, we have to pick, choose the people that are on the top of the list. And that in regards to diversity doesn't really lend well to creating a diverse department for the future. I, there is a very diverse department that I heard last night. Well, I can um, just say that I think this anyway. is a, a good point that there's something for town meeting. We should have this information available and I think uh, we can look forward and look at the current standing. So um, that would be grand. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see. Um, David Lind. Thank you very much. This is David Lynn, town meeting member from Precinct 1. Um, I, I guess some of the questions I had about uh, civil service that came up on the call last night that I still had a little confusion about. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of the standards for, for civil service are at the state level, um, but there's some things that can then become town specific. The example that came up was the maximum age requirement. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm trying to understand a little bit more about what parts of civil service are rigid requirements and then what parts can be amended and are more flexible um, at the at the individual community. So thank you, David. We actually did some looking into this today and we found in, in regards to specifically to the age requirement in 2003, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, um, the town adopted uh, chapter 31, section 58 of civil service that specifically calls um, an age requirement into into the town. So if the town votes to remove itself from civil service, the age requirement will go away. And so that was like one of the options within the civil service menu of choices, or that so was something it, that like we made up and said, hey, let's put in an age requirement. No, that, that, that's a choice. Uh, the civil service office. Civil service is actually a law, a law with chapters and sections. And so you can adopt different sections of the civil service law. In the town in 2003, um, after uh, I believe it was retirement reform, adopted yep. uh, 58A that is the minimum age requirement um, for maximum age requirement for when you're taking the entrance exam. Okay, that's really helpful to understand that it's like there's an array of parts of civil service and we are into some and not into all of them. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Um, Jean Mooney, I see your hands up. Thank you. I think one of the points from last night that came became clear to me is, and perhaps um, I'm hearing the word diversity brought up, um, which I think is needed, but I think we need to, is the question about how are we defining diversity? I mean, we're thinking of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. But I think what I also heard is we're looking at skill sets and other backgrounds. And I think that that's what the mm -hmm. chief was trying to, to get at. And so perhaps we need to define what, what diversity means um, going forward. If there's a goal for diversity, um, what, what does that mean? So just a suggestion. Just one more quick point. Um, we, we talked about diversity. When I went through the chief's hiring process, we talked talked about diversity, we talked about the subject. There's a bigger problem for Belmont than just diversity. We don't have enough candidates on the list 
to fill the positions that we're going to have in the future. It's what happened to Lexington. It's what happened to Belmont. If you go on the civil service website, you can look at the police officer eligibility list. And if you look at the communities and you look at the number of people on the list, there's a socioeconomic correlation between how many people are on the list in, in the wealthier communities versus more working class communities. Work, more working class communities tend to have more veterans. Um, we, have, we have nine people, Belmont residents on our list right now. Watertown for some reason has 29. They're not having the same problem that we're having in Belmont. Lexington, uh, their list was basically non-existent and, and they were down 25% in the department. So it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, population based. If you have more people in your community, naturally you're gonna have more people that are available to take the civil service test. So diversity is certainly a part of it. But the other problem is we just don't have enough candidates in Belmont to take the test, that are taking the test these days. Thank you. Um, Chris Doyle, I see your hand is up. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I had um, two questions. One was um, last night, there were some questions about cost implications. Um, and I understand that it can be challenging to come up with some estimates, but you guys did have some thoughts about that. And I was wondering whether you were going to be preparing um, some rough ideas with um, some transparent assumptions about what those uh, might be. That's a question. What, by that, I mean for town meeting. So that's a question. And my second question is just following up on a couple of the diversity points. Um, um, one person mentioned there was <laughs> they had heard about a lot of diversity. I was wondering if the um, chief um, from both departments could repeat what they answered. I asked this question last night. Could you repeat how many women are in the police department and how many women are in the fire department? Thank you. Seven so, women in the police department. Out of how many? Could you, sir, out of how many? We, we, well, we have 49 sworn. We have three vacancies right now, but so it would be out of 46. Uh, we have seven females. And in the fire department? So we have 52 uh, people in the rank and file plus myself, um, which is 53, and four of them are women. Thank you. And if I could just speak for one second about diversity. Um, we, Chief Frizzell and I, conducted interviews um, about a year or two ago where we were hiring one uh, candidate. and. This is one of the problems I think with civil service and diversity is the number three candidate was a Hispanic male. He was a fantastic candidate and we could not reach him because um, we could not bypass number one and number two. That's not to say that number one, who I'm sure we hired, was not a good candidate, but um, it makes it difficult to diversify when you have those restrictions where it's very difficult to bypass um, one and two to get to number three. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Weiss, I see your hands up. Jack Weiss, Precinct One. I uh, just want to follow up on David Lynn's um, uh, comments or questions because I, I, I'm not sure that I understood this from last night's uh, discussion. Um, it, it sounds like some of the things that we adopted, like a residency requirement uh, for police officers or this age um, issue, maximum age, maybe a veteran preference. Uh, it, it's, it sounds like from tonight's discussion that we don't have the ability to shape those, those constraints or those options. What we can do is choose off of a menu of uh, programs or constraints that are defined at the state level and can't be customized at all. We can just choose to adopt them or not. Is, is that correct? That's correct, Jack. I talked to civil service today because there was some questions about how we could uh, diversify or reach new candidates through the list. So every community in Massachusetts, with the exception of New Bedford, have residential preference. That means if you resided in the community for one year up until you took the test, 
you get residential preference in that community. New Bedford does not have residential preference. So if you go on the, the site, you can look at their list. Three, number three through 36 are disabled veterans, 38 through 86 are veterans from all different kinds of communities. So when you take the civil service exam as a, as a prospective you know, police officer or firefighter, or at least a police officer, you fill out your three top choices. So if I'm a disabled vet and I know Bedford, New Bedford doesn't have residential preference, that's the first one I'm putting down. Or if I'm a veteran, that's the first place I'm putting down. So if we were to get rid of residential preference and say, okay, Belmont doesn't have residential preference, that's what kind of a list we're gonna get from people all over the state on that list. Some of them are gonna to live too far away. You have to live within 15 miles of the community uh, where you work. So, and, and the way the list works, I'll give you an idea of our list here in Belmont. Um, number one and two and three, uh, the sons and daughters of uh, uh, disabled firefighters or police officers or, or the sons and daughters of police officers or firefighters who died in the line of service. Four through 12 are Belmont residents, 13 through 42 are disabled vets, non-Belmont residents, 44 through 77 are veterans, non-Belmont residents. 78 up to 400 is all the other people. Now there's an interesting, I looked at one, there's a kid from Winchester that's number 411 on our list. And to give you an idea how residential preference works, while he's 411 on our list that he probably put down at his second choice, that same candidate is number 14 on the Winchester list. So it's not a matter of, it's like you said, we have a menu and we, we have to pick a certain certain amount of that. Now, and, and it's the state that says residential preference means one year of living. It, you can't define it as nine months or six months or whatever. It's, it's defined by the state um, that's as right. to what each of those mean. And that's why, uh, that's why Jack, uh, four years ago, um, that was hatched at a Martin Luther King breakfast we proposed legislation that would create a residential preference type of preference for any graduate of Belmont High School. So if we had a graduate, because you know how expensive, I don't have to tell people how expensive it is if you're a 20 something to, to have to live in Belmont in an apartment. So if you've graduated from Belmont in 2010 and you happen to be you know, living with four friends in South Boston, you would get residential preference in Belmont. If that, if that law passed. And if we leave civil service, we can make that a preference on our, on our entrance exam. We can say, you're gonna get preference if you graduated from Belmont High School. You'll get preference if you live in Belmont. That's what- Does the state also um, dictate um, the, the kind of tiering or the order? If you say we want veteran preference and residential preference and no. disability preference, do they say veterans have to come first or residents have to come, do they, dictate under civil service how those preferences are ordered? Civil service uh, gives an absolute preference for veterans, disabled preference, and the sons and daughters of disabled firefighters or line of death firefighters and police officers. So as I mentioned last night, we don't have any veterans on our list this year. If a veteran got a 70 on the test, they would be just a minimum passing score, they would be on the top of our list this year. So they get an absolute preference. That's why New Bedford that has the first 86 people are all, all veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the clock now, it's five after nine. So I, there are a few more questions that I would ask you to be as brief as you can. Um, I think at 9.15, I'm absolutely gonna uh, close down the meeting, but we would like to get as much information out as possible. Um, let's see, uh, Vincent Stanton, your hands up. in Stanton Precinct 3. Um, I think that the uh, example that the uh, that Chief McIsaac just gave actually is uh, extremely uh, illuminating and be helpful for uh, uh, town meeting members to hear. Uh, my question is, uh, it was described earlier that um, existing uh, members of the uh, uh, police and fire would be grandfathered in 
uh, and that the, uh, to, they would uh, retain their civil service status. And I, I think I understand this from the answers to other questions, but I want to be sure. So, um, I, because the, the obvious question is, well, how do you have a promotion system wh where some people are grandfathered into civil service and other people are not in civil service? And I think the answer is that you don't use the civil service criteria uh, for the people who are grandfathered into civil service when you're deciding about uh, promotions. It only would uh, benefit them if they um, lost their job in Belmont and sought uh, work in another community. Is, is that correct? Well, what I'd like to speak to in terms of the promotion is currently, and I can only speak um, to some of it, is currently in the fire department, only 30% um, of the promotion is based on the written exam through civil service. 20% um, is weighed with education and experience, and then 50% is the assessment center that the town currently pays for and um, has operated under. So currently civil service is weighed less for the promotions in the fire department. And Acting Chief Haley, please correct me if I'm wrong about that data. That is correct. Uh, we, we began that this last phase of uh, promotions that we made and uh, it was a success. So um, it was something new. Um, however, it shows more um, that the material that's been studied and uh, the, the people taking the written exam for, it shows that they can apply it and that uh, the way they apply it is, uh, is now graded. And waited. <clears throat> I think uh, Vincent Stan's question. Um, maybe this way: all the anyone seeking to to be promoted, or anyone no, sorry, anyone post. If we get out of civil service, anybody who was promoted would then leave civil service. If somebody chooses to take a promotion, they will then leave civil service. And. Okay, sorry, and, and will they, but, but the, dis, the decision about who gets promoted, um, the, the uh, folks who were in civil service bef before the, before, who were hired before we left civil service, they won't benefit from being evaluated under a different set of metrics than uh, the more recent hires. No, promotional standards would be, the promotional procedure and standards would be negotiated with the unions and we would develop a promotional procedure, whether it's in, in the case of a police department and mostly it likely be a full assessment center or maybe a combination of a written exam and an assessment center. But, you know, they, they would, so a, a patrol officer would re, remain in civil service. If they decided to take a promotion to sergeant, they would leave civil service. Thank you. I'm just going to um, move to the last couple of questions here. Um, Michael McNamara. Uh, Michael McNamara, I have like two minutes. I'm going to use them. Um, question for uh, Town Administrator Garvin. Has cost an analyst or cost analysis been done to inform our town meetings before our vote on civil service? Has there been a cost analyst, anal, anal, <clears throat> analyst done, a cost analysis done? So, um, yes as no. a Last night we indicated some costs that we've identified, but we're currently doing a cost breakdown and we'll try and have something for town meeting. Sorry, I just we only have two minutes. I'm gonna be really quick here. Um, when will this be done? Um, well, there's a week in, or in a few days um, until town meeting, so it'll be done during that time. Will this be discussed at the um, with the select board and will they also um, loop in our town clerk? Um, our, sorry, not our town clerk, our, um, our uh, sort of our town um, legal counsel. And I just, I, I want to express some concern because we talk a lot about benefits of this, of leaving, the financial benefits, but I've seen no numbers, no solid numbers, no cost analysis. And it's very concerning for me. I don't, that's my time. So, and I can appreciate that concern. Um, I think I stated last night that what, some of the things that we did prior to last night was to do a look back on what we thought some of the cost savings would have been over the last five years if the town wasn't in civil service. 
Um, I stated that a lot of the costs are going to be assumptions moving forward because a lot of those costs are dependent on negotiations in the future. So we can do assumptions, we can do some analysis, but um, we'll be working on that um, up until town meeting. Thank you. Um, I see we have five minutes left and I see um, Michael S. and Jesse Bennett. So I would ask you, uh, please be as brief as you can. Again, town meeting is coming up, so there'll be plenty of time for um, discussion and debate at that time. Good evening, everybody. Can you just uh, identify yourself, please. Michael Stewart. I'm actually a current member of the Belmont Police Department. And I can put, give some good insight because I've actually taken the tests on both sides of the aisle, both civil service and non-civil service, and I'm also a veteran, uh, a veteran of the armed forces. So um, unfortunately enough, leaving civil service is not the solution that everybody thinks it is. Um, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, I'm afraid with just a few minutes left, is the purpose of this evening is to ask- I have a question. So the, the question is, is that the, the, what would be the standardized portion of this? Would there be a, uh, an, exam, an examination given to entry level uh, candidates um, to be hired. Thank and you. What would the standards be as far as the hiring process? Thank you. So again, some of those things, as, as Chief McIsaac mentioned, um, are negotiable and we cannot disclose um, what we um, plan on bringing into the negotiations. Um, I think any good negotiator will tell you that's probably not a good idea. So what we can say is we would something along the lines of what Chief McIsaac has stated is that we plan on looking at it and moving forward with hiring procedures and practices. We currently have good hiring procedures and practices in place throughout town. We have a very in-depth robust process that we currently have in other departments. So we would hopefully be able to just follow what we do now to get the best candidates for the residents of Belmont. So it seems like there's a big push to remove a veteran's preference from the hiring process. No. We can, if you, if, I'll just, I won't talk about ours, but if you look at Lexington, they offer a preference for veterans. They offer a preference for people who live in Lexington. They offer a preference for um, people who speak certain languages. So you can, uh, you can tailor it. Um, you know, you create a policy and, and you, you adhere to the policy. So it's not an absolute. And there's no, and then we'd be losing the benefit of like everybody kind of combed over. There's laws protecting the hiring process. We're going to lose all those, correct? All the laws that protect the hiring process, we're going to lose those under civil service if we move out of civil service. The only law that I know of under civil service is that we have to pick the person that scores highest on the test. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm incorrect about that, but. They could be bypassed, but they, you need to have a legitimate reason and there. There has to be substantial right. amount of evidence to bypass somebody. Right, and the evidence is the bypassing a candidate is very difficult and time consuming. I'm gonna step in right here. I think this is gonna be fruit for negotiations if, if this pursues in this direction. I hate to do this, but I'm watching the clock very carefully and see we're almost at 9.15. So I said um, one more question from Jesse Bennett, and then we're going to uh, save all the discussion for town meeting coming up on the 21st. Um, so Jesse, please go ahead. Hi, Lori. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, Jesse Bennett, Precinct 1, town meeting member. Um, I just want a clarification. It... Um, Chief McIsaac referred to, you know, the people on the list, um, many of them being disabled veterans and um, those people still have to uh, pass exams and this, they have to meet the same standards that, um, that any other applicant would have to meet for these jobs, right? So their disabilities could be any number of things and ones that wouldn't interfere with the job um, according to the screening it involved in civil service. I just wanted to verify that because I, I, I was a little concerned that we're talking about these disabled veterans in a way that makes them sound not desirable as candidates when um, I would assume that, you know, if they're, if they're applying to become firefighters or police officers that they've met certain standards if they make the list. Is that the case? Or is that not the case? 
we've, so we've been we've been successful in the past hiring disabled veterans. Um, mm -hmm. It's they have to participate in a physical abilities test. They have mm -hmm. to pass everything else that every you know all the other candidates uh, you know go through. So um, you're right. There's a wide range of uh, disabilities that that people can have, and uh, mm -hmm. but they all everybody has to go through the same standards. Right. So that wouldn't make the, those people on that list um, undesirable. Say. No. Right. Okay. No. Great. I just wanted to verify that because it it concerns me if we're saying if we're using that as an argument for getting out of civil service. Wait. Because yeah. So. Wait. We're using that term because civil service; those are the that's the those are the three absolute preferences: disabled mm -hmm. veteran, veteran. So, a disabled veteran is a head of a veteran, right? Has a preference over a veteran, and a head of a veteran and a disabled veteran is the sons and daughters of um, of you know disabled police officers, firefighters, or police officers, firefighters who were killed in the line of duty, right? Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move to this very last slide here. I would like to thank everyone very much for um, their very productive discussion and for everyone being here who uh, was able to answer the questions. Um, as a reminder, the town meeting will be on Monday, September 21st, starting at 6 o'clock, continuing on to September 23rd, as the moderator described, and then go on to September 30th if necessary. Um, there's lots of information coming from the town clerk about how to log into Zoom, reminders about how to use the turning point accounts to vote. Um, and so we look forward to seeing everyone in a few weeks. Thank you again for your time. Good night.